what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. All right, Hubert Jolie, love the name. It brought me back to high school when that's the, I last spoke French and learned about the French culture. So it's good to have a Frenchman on the show. Welcome to the Learning Leader Show. Thank you, Ryan. Are we going to do this in French or are you speaking French? <laughs> no <through> way. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, was it un petit or un peu? Uh, un petit peu. Un petit. Okay. That's all I know. Uh, okay. Appel, I, I got some of that stuff. Tra let's make it très bien, though. Okay. We'll do our best <laughs> to make it good. Um, yeah. First, I want to ask you, even though you've accomplished so much in your life and you're still like at it trying to serve and help others I, I have to ask you from an emotional perspective how do you feel when you see this this is the cover of your book how do you feel when you see this and Ryan uh, I got the first copy of the actual book what you have is the advanced readers copy I got it on Friday oh this was emotional I mean I, I have it here yeah this was this was emotional uh, this is it. Writing a book is a ton of work. Uh, I give a lot of credit to Caroline Lambert, who's worked with me on this book, and our editor Scott at HBR Press. So I'm super excited. I, I I can't wait. My dream is for the book to get into as many hands and heads and hearts as possible to make a positive difference in the world. So this is it's really hard to describe. Very exciting. That's what I would say. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, though, after everything you've accomplished, though, there is just something special and unique about getting your words onto the page and seeing it all put together and seeing the cover design. And it's like in your names, the author of the book. And it, it, I, I, I find uh it's just such a cool moment it's such a cool thing regardless of anything else you've ever done like having your 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 words and print i would imagine and maybe you can speak to this usually it is because of 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 guys like you yeah i can see behind you here your your bookshelf guys like you are so well read and you probably hold writers and authors who have shared so much of their soul with you even though they don't know it directly that that now you become part of that club. It's just a different type of a feeling, huh? There's that. And I was thinking as you were speaking, it's also this idea, this is a gift that I'm making to people out in the world. And I put my, I put a lot of my soul, my heart. Uh, we worked really hard because we wanted it, not just the ideas to be right, but we want it to be easy to read and we want it to be helpful. So, guys, we've given it our all. So this is a gift to you as you lead, as you seek to become a better leader, which is uh, what the journey that all of us are on. This is my gift. I've given everything. <laughs> mm, I love it. Well, let's start. Let's jump into it. So as I cracked it open, I have... Um, read about and actually talked to Jim Citrin. Yep. And Jim is uh, the leader of the CEO practice at Spencer Stewart. It's an executive search company. And so can you, uh, you bear take us back to May 2012. And you're talking to Jim. And I'll let you go from there. So Jim is an old friend of mine. We've known each other for more than 30 years. And in May, we you know, he talks to me about Best Buy and I said, Jim, you're crazy, right? So, so guys, you have to rewind. Back in 2012, every, so I lived in Minneapolis, which is where Best Buy is headquartered. Everybody thought Best Buy was going to die. And Jim tells me about, so the CEO has just gone uh, and he wants me to think about becoming the, the CEO. I was the CEO of another Minneapolis-based company. I knew nothing about retail and the place was a complete zoo at the time destined to die so i tell jim you're crazy they said no 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 first they're not looking for a retailer they're looking for somebody to take a fresh perspective um you're a great turnaround guy because i had done quite a few turnaround saving companies that were threatened by technology the internet digital and so forth and he tells me i think you'd, you'd be great i think this is for you and so do me a favor study take a look at it and so that's what I did. I did 
I was a mystery shopper. I visited stores. I read everything I could about the company. I spoke with alumni. I watched every or listened to every earnings call that uh, the company had done, investor meetings. And my mind, I changed my mind because yeah. I thought the world needed Best Buy, right? Because those of us who are interested in technology, for some of our purchases, we need, to, we need a place where to see, touch, and feel the stuff and get advice. And then the vendors needed Best Buy because they need a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment. So I saw that, and I saw that the issues that Best Buy had were all self-inflicted. The, the previous management team was complaining about headwinds, you know, on the earning calls. They we're doing great, but there's these headwinds, you know, price deflation, Apple opening stores. And so I told myself, let's imagine that I would call Tim Cook and Jeff Bezos and say, uh, how's the wind where you're sailing? And I bet they would say, oh my God, you bear. <laughs> we're having the time of our life. The wind is just fabulous. So I would hang up and say, wind's probably not the problem. We, Best Buy must be the problem. And then that was great news because if it's self-inflicted, then you can fix it. You can fix the price. You can fix the website experience, the supply chain, the customer you know, and, and, and the cost structure. You can do it. And that's what we did. So I'm so glad. So when, we when the time came for me to meet with the board, I told them I want this job and this is how I would approach it. I, I feel I've prepared my entire life for this. And so that's the story. What, what is there a part of you from your upbringing or maybe just from your your career that was attracted to the fact that that Best Buy was in bad shape and that perhaps you could be the one to fix it? Yeah, I, I love challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And let's agree at the time, Best Buy was the all you can eat menu of challenges. You had strategic <laughs> challenges with Amazon and, and so forth. You had operational challenges the quality of service having gone down. You had leadership challenges with the CEO having been fired. You had, and you had shareholder challenges with the share price really down uh, to $11 uh, at some point. And then the founder, you know, the amazing Dick Schultz wanted to take the company private. And all of my, you know, professional life, uh, I loved problem solving. Um, I did a few turnarounds at McKinsey and, and after that, and also, Best Buy was this uh, iconic American company, great success story, right? And I'd, uh, when I was in the video games industry, so here's the scoop, Ryan. In 2000, I greenlit World of Warcraft when I was in the video games industry, and I have credits on Diablo 2. So anybody who is in video games, that means something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would visit Best Buy in Minneapolis and I had seen how much better they were compared to their competitors to the point that I had asked Brad Anderson, uh, who was the CEO of Best Buy until 2009, to join my board at Council and Companies. Hmm. And I felt that uh, it was tragic that they had gone sideways. And so, yes, uh, saving, you know, who doesn't want to save the world? In that case, not saving the world. I don't know. I don't know. If saving Best Buy. I don't know, though. Do you, it, I mean, was it... Um... Like, was it just about the fact that like you love the challenge of it or what else was, I mean, I would imagine it was more money too, or was it not about that at uh, all? You didn't care about no, that? No, it's in, in fact, it, if we slow down, yeah, that leads to a number of reflections, right? Yeah. Which are in the, in the book. Why do we work? Yep. What's our purpose in life? Is work a curse or a punishment because some dude sinned in paradise? <laughs> Is it uh, something we do so that we can do something else that's much more fun? Or is work part of our quest for meaning mm. and something that enables us, can enable us to be fulfilled as an individual? Is it an invitation to do some good in the world? Or like the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran wrote, you know, is work, love made visible? Clearly, I'm in the second column. And what drives me in this question of what drives you as an individual is essential in business, right? Why are you here? And so my purpose in life is to try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have at any point in time to make a positive difference in the world. That's what drives me. And I felt that Best Buy was a platform 
and 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 you know when you look at it and people have told me you know we we saved you know of course more than 100,000 jobs but we with the families and so forth we've impacted hundreds of thousands of people at the company the vendors uh, the community the Minneapolis community and the the, the communities in which we have stores it, it's it's uh, We've changed lives, you know, after a, a, a general manager, a store general manager meeting, one of the GMs came to me and said, Hubert, thank you for saving Best Buy. Mm. Thanks to this, my children will be able to go to college. Mm. I told him, oh my God, let me go back to work. I need to work harder. <laughs> mm. And that's that, and this idea of what drives us, everybody, Many people now in business talk about corporate purpose, you know, the, the idea that contrary to what Milton Friedman wanted us to believe, the purpose of a company is not to make money, it's an outcome. Uh, for me, the magic, and that's, you know, a large part of what ex- drives or has driven the amazing results of Best Buy is when people can connect what drives them, what's in their heart and their soul with the purpose of the company doing great things in the world that's where magic happens (laughs) so for those people currently who have a fine job at a fine company and they earn a good living to support their family but they don't really care about the mission um maybe they don't have a good boss who's not a good leader who doesn't care about listening to podcasts or reading books or not they're not in it to serve they're they're in it to to see their bank account get bigger what do you what advice do you give to that person because i you bear the reason i say this because i feel like that's unfortunately it's 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 more common than i wish it was what do you like do you say hey it's you gotta go find another place to work do you try to make it make make your current place great even if there's others around you who don't feel that like what is it what advice do you give to that person because it seems like and you certainly went and made that change at Best Buy, but you you led from the top as the CEO of the company, and 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 then it kind of it went to the, the your leadership then flowed to the leaders within the business and on down to every single person that worked there. But that's not the case other places. What about the people yeah. who are in the middle? Yeah. What advice do you give to them? There's a pandemic of disengagement at work, right? There's all sorts of statistics that show that the vast majority of people are not fully uh, engage. So what advice? Number one, so <laughs> actually applies in this uh, COVID pandemic. If you cannot go outside, go inside. Mm. So start about, you know, I think leadership starts from within. Mm-hmm. Being clear about how you want to live your life. What's important to you? What are some boundaries? What matters? How do you want to be remembered? What kind of eulogy would you like to have mm. and being clear about this? And that's that's a journey for all of us to work on that. We find this a lot of uh, spiritual work and, and personal work. Uh, and then where you are in your life, whether it's at work or in, in, in any group of people where you are a member, try to be the best version of yourself uh, and make it, you know, do what you, uh, are meant to be, be the most beautiful, biggest uh, version of yourself. Um, sometimes bosses can be an excuse, but I've seen at, at Best Buy so many of our store general manager, I've learned, you know, Ryan, I've learned so much from these leaders. So one of them, for example, in Boston, he would ask every one of the associates in his store, what is your dream? Mm. Tell me about your dream. At Best Buy, outside of Best Buy, so write it down in the break room. And then he said, okay, my job is to help you achieve your dream. Mm-hmm. Now, nobody told him to do this, right? I mean, we created an environment where it was completely congruent to want to do this, but he was able to do this. Now, having said that to your question, if you feel that the environment in which you are does not allow you to be yourself and to be the best version, the most beautiful, biggest version of yourself. And you know, you've tried and it doesn't work. And if you have the choice, not everybody does, right? But if you have the ability, then leave. So as an example, in the late 1990s, after leaving McKinsey, I was the president of EDS France. 
electronic data system, the old Raspberry uh, company. And we were you know, doing a lot of great stuff. We were turning around the business, growing the business. And then there was a change of leadership in Plano, Texas. And it felt that the new regime was really focused purely on profits. That was the only thing that mattered. And the only way they were thinking about it. It felt to me, rightly or wrongly. And they were centralizing a lot of decisions in Plano, Texas. So in France, we were growing and we had to have a hiring freeze. I said, how can you grow a service business if you have a hiring freeze? You just can't, it's crazy. So I said, that's okay. The world is big. They can have EDS. I can explore the rest of the world. And I left. Mm. And uh, because- You were president at the time. I was president of the French business. Wow, okay. Uh, big job, yeah. Big job, but small on the global scale. And I didn't feel- that the environment made it possible for me to do what I aspire to do. And so it's like, you know, we're the captains of our life. So we have to decide what are the boundaries. And if we feel that uh, we cannot, uh, you know, create the right environment. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to look for the perfect environment. There's always problems. There's always people who are, you know, that, you think should behave different. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is not about looking for perfection, but if the environment is beyond the boundaries that you define, um, and if you have a choice, then then leave, you'll, you'll, you'll be happier. Because, you know, when you ask people how they want to be remembered and what's going to be important when they retire or during their eulogy, it's rarely, oh, I made VP by the age of 30, or my banking account, was bigger than my neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not that's not the source of happiness, right? I, I read something that you you said you picked up from I believe a mentor, it might have been at McKinsey, where you said profit and you just you just briefly touched on it. Profit should be an outcome, not a goal. And yet so did was was there no profit goal at Best Buy? Uh, and you just said, hey, uh -huh. okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. Let's talk about this. This okay. is fundamental. So I learned this from a client when I was at McKinsey. Yeah. He was the CEO of a, of a French client. And he said, uh, the meeting I had with him, he said, the profit of a corporation is not to make money. It's an imperative. It's not the ultimate goal. In business, he continued, you actually have three imperatives. I think it's gotten even broader since then. But uh, he said, you have a people imperative. You need to have good people who are well-trained, well-equipped, able to do a good job. Then you have a business imperative. You need to have customers who are happy and want more. And then you have a financial imperative, which is you need to make money. And his view was that excellence on the people imperative is what leads to excellence on the business imperative, which leads to excellence on the financial imperative. And, and he draws some immediate implications saying, for example, when uh, you have your monthly business review, don't start with financial results. Start with people and organization, continue with customers and business, and mm. finish with finance. You will always have enough time because your CFO will make sure. Uh, but if you flip it, you're never going to have time for customers and people. Um, and so I think the role of business leaders at any level, whether you're a store channel manager or a CEO, it's the same, is to manage um, you know, all of the stakeholders of your organization, uh, you have to see the, the company or your organization as a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal, which I think to me has got to be to do something good in the world. Mm -hmm. And you have to work with all of the stakeholders, so employees, customers, vendors, community, and shareholders to create extraordinary outcomes. And you have to refuse. So here's a trick uh, to remember. 98% of the questions that are asked as either or in business are better, answers as, uh, better answered as ends. So should we take care of our customers or the shareholders? Both. Should we take care of the short term or the long term? Both. You know, should we focus on revenue or cost? Both. You know, it makes life so much easier. And so... 
of course, you have targets in terms of employee engagement, customer satisfaction, uh, your carbon footprint, you know, the growth of the company, the long-term financial return, and you, your job is to orchestrate that in a way that is congruent and harmonious. And that's what we did at, at, at Best Buy. So you do have goals that are of a financial nature because shareholders are really important. They take care of our retirement, Ryan. You care about retirement? Yeah, yes, you do. For sure. So that's how we're going to get our retirement is who would they do with- So you have the goals, but it's just your your method for achieving them may look different than than others. And there's a big difference between an imperative and the ultimate goal, the true mm -hmm. north, like my friend Bill George likes to say, your noble purpose. I think that, you know, in my vision, because let's again, slow down. Um, can we agree, Ryan, that the world today is facing a multifaceted crisis, mm -hmm. health crisis, economic, societal, justice, systemic racism, environmental, you know, you got the list. Mm -hmm. And then what's the definition of madness, right? Per Einstein. Doing the, doing the same, same thing, thing. And expecting a different result. Exactly. So I think the last, pick a number, 40, 50 years have been dominated by the thinking of two individuals, or you can summarize it like this. One, Milton Friedman with the idea of shareholder primacy and that profit was the only thing you cared about. And two, Bob McNamara with the idea that uh, you know, the former Secretary of Defense in the 60s, that the approach to business is uh, you, you take a bunch of smart people, they create a smart strategy, implementation plan, you communicate, you track, you, maybe you put incentives in place and hope that good things happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> None of this happens. I think we need, to, so the conclusion for this is we need a refoundation, and that's the purpose of my book, right? We need a refoundation of business and I think capitalism, and it's around two or three uh, key ideas. It's, and it's the philosophy that was behind the turnaround and research and self by Number one, it's about pursuing business, about pursuing a noble purpose, doing something good in the world. And we'll, we'll use examples, right? But that's the first thing. Two is put people at the center. A company is a human organization made of individuals working together. So it's all about the people and what they do. And I don't care whether you're a tech company or a professional services firm, in both cases, it's people that do things. Nothing happens other than through people. The third idea is embrace all stakeholders. And uh, the fourth idea is your job as a leader is to create an environment where people can do amazing things that this idea of unleashing human magic that I talk about in the book and then you treat profit as an outcome rather than the goal. That's the architecture. Now, what's interesting, Ryan, is that uh, today, I would say that most people agree that this is the right approach. I think there's been a sea change. And frankly, after last year, you would need to be blind <laughs> not to see that we need to change our ways and that this is the right approach. If, you know, if you live in Minneapolis, when the after the, the murder of George Floyd, when the city is on fire, do you think we can open the stores? Of course you cannot. If the planet is on fire, do you think that you can run a business? Of course not. So we have to change our ways. I think that's the approach. And the challenge today is not convincing people that this is the right approach. It's it's how to do this. This is it sounds soft, it's really hard to do. And the purpose of my writing this book is to provide a based on what everything I've learned in the last you know 10, 20, 30 years is to create a guide for leaders who are interested in getting rid of the old ways and you know progressing on this journey of leading from a place of purpose and, and with humanity, which I think can create extraordinary results in a, a much more sustainable. Uh, future and back to your point, a lot more happiness with employees, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, Uber. Can I ask you a, a question or two about McKinsey? I've read yep. read about McKinsey a lot. I've worked with people from McKinsey that come into a previous company I worked at. You worked there for I believe thirteen years, the yep. beginning of your career, right? Yeah. So I'm, I I was always 
fascinated about you, 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 you're very highly educated, went to great schools that to go into a consulting role without a ton of real world experience seems like it would be really hard. How, how, how did you be a value added resource to your clients at McKinsey when you didn't have that much experience? Yeah, so I have very fond memories of my time at McKinsey and all of my friends there and everything I've learned. The emphasis in the, these early years of my career um, was around problem solving. So that's what you did as a consultant. You, you didn't go in and say, I have 30 years of experience in retailing. Let me tell you what's key in retailing. I mean, I, I had zero experience. <laughs> but you take a problem you uh, analyze it, you break it down, you do some fact finding, some analysis, you look at all sorts of facts. And so you work collaboratively with the client who's got a lot of the ideas. You, you manage your process to get to a great outcome. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the consulting profession, whether it's McKinsey or others, has grown significantly because there is value in doing this. What I say in the book, though, is that for me personally, as a human being, I've had to make a journey, <laughs> frankly, from you know, the hard charging, very analytical, really oriented towards problem solving kind of guy mm -hmm. who believes that being smart is really what matters. And sometimes is a bit too driven to add too much value and wants to make sure that uh, everybody knows how smart I am. <laughs> you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. you, we've all seen some of these, right? For I sure. was one of them. For sure. Uh, and uh, there was an evolution. You know, there's an arc in my life moving from that to today, somebody who believes in human magic and believes that the role of the leader is not to be this, the 20th century image of the leader is the superhero who is here to save the day, very smart, very powerful, uh, so oftentimes driven by power, fame, glory, or money, right? No, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and today, the role of the leader is much more somebody who can create the environment in which others can be successful. And that means, uh, you know, being clear about, again, why are you here? What's your purpose? How you want to be remembered? That also goes through vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it took me years, Ryan, to understand that uh, the quest for perfection was evil <laughs> and that being able to say, my name is Uber and I don't know, or my name is Uber and I made a mistake was the right approach. You know, it's mm -hmm. hard. Uh, but I'll tell you a story to make it concrete, right? Because uh, so back to 2012, right, when I joined Best Buy. Uh, before joining Best Buy, I started to work a, a few years before that with, a, with an executive coach in 2009, when I was CEO of Carlson Companies. Before that, if somebody had told me, you know, Jack or Mary, they're working with a coach, I would say, what's wrong with them, right? Are they in trouble? Are they going to be fired? Who needs a coach, right? But then it hit me that uh, exactly 100% of the top 100 tennis players in the world have a coach. Exactly 100% of uh, the NFL teams, NBA, uh, you know, Major League Baseball, you know, Champions League in soccer, everybody's got a coach. So what would be, you know, so special about executives? Are they demigods that they don't need a coach? And so I started to work with a coach, the fabulous, the one and only Marshall Goldsmith, who's like oh, the father of executives. Adam on. He's, he's the man. Yeah. He's the man. And, you know, he was at the time working for successful leaders like Anand Malali and Dr. Jim Kim at the World Bank. And I said, oh, I want one of those. Right? Yeah. And he taught me about feet forward. He made it, he made the process of getting better a very joyous process. And so fast forward. So when I joined Best Buy three months after that, I told my team, look, let's agree. This turnaround is going to be hard, right? It's, 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 Everybody thinks we're going to die, so we can't agree it's going to be hard. So that means each one of us is going to need to be the best version of ourselves, the best possible leader we can be. And that starts with me. So I have a coach. His name is Marshall. He's going to come in. 
I would really appreciate it if you could spend time with him and give him some feedback about how I'm doing. And at the time, things were going great, right? don't get me wrong, but I would really value that. So I got the feedback and Marshall, one of his trick is to say, on the good stuff, digest it. On the other stuff, you, better, you don't need to do anything, right? There's no God that says you need to address any of this. It's your decision. So I decided based on what I heard, that there was um, two or three things I wanted to get better at. I went through, so I gathered the team, and this was this is excruciating pain, right? Make it sound easy. This is excruciating pain. Thank you for the feedback. I uh, really appreciate it. There's two or three things I've decided to work on. Number one, number two, number three. You have to say it. I'm going to follow up with each of you to ask you for advice on how I can get better on these three things. And then three or four months from now, I'll follow up with you to check how I'm doing and ask for more advice. So is that making yourself vulnerable? I think so. That's, that's how it, it felt. But okay. what it does then is that it signaled to, first it helped me, <laughs> frankly, uh, because we all need to get better. Every year, ever since I was, uh, when I was CEO of Best Buy, every year we would repeat, rinse and repeat, because you're always, Working. And if you run into somebody from Best Buy, ask them, what are you working, what are you working on to get better at? Uh, but the other thing is, and it's related, is that it's a signal that it was okay to want to be better at something. And it's creating an environment where uh, we could be vulnerable, we could help each other, right? Because if you're Jack uh, or Ryan, you're working on three things, and I'm Uber and I'm working on three things, so you're going to ask me for help. And of course, I'm going to help. So we're going to help each other. So the idea of the all-powerful superhero is gone. But right? you don't imagine, you know, Superman or Batman. My name is Batman. I need help. <laughs> he doesn't do this. Uh, and so that's... Uh, I think that's a critical point, Uber, I, that all leaders... I have yet to meet somebody that either wouldn't benefit from a coach or... Yeah isn't currently benefiting from a coach. I, that person in my mind doesn't exist. Okay. In fact, it's, it's, it's amazing to me personally, the, the people who reach out to me to help with this, this line of work and part of my business, the, 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 the cool thing about it, you bear is they are in a lot of cases, ultra successful as far as business and home life is concerned. Uh, their, their people for the most part are really impressed with the way they lead. They're very humble. They're like the last people who seem to need it. And yet they're the ones consistently reaching out and the ones who I've looked out upon in the world who definitely need it and should be reaching out. They don't ever seem to be doing that. And so I think it's like a signal in itself from a great leadership perspective. Are you raising your hand to say, absolutely i want to coach absolutely it's worth it to invest i know marshall is not cheap he told me how much he charges when he was on the show right it's a big investment but it shows from your end how committed you are to working on yourself to get better so what message is that sending to the rest of the team yeah. it's amazing yeah exactly and one of the greatest joys i have now that i'm no longer a ceo is that together with my wife, uh, Hortense, who's written this great book that you also see behind me, right, Aligned, we are working together and coaching CEOs and senior executives. It's awesome. And bringing the, the very personal side of uh, personal development and the business side together. Because as leaders, one of the lessons for me of the last 12 months, if it was not obvious before, is as leaders, we need to lead with all of our body parts, right? Not just the brain, but the heart, the soul, the guts, the ears, the eyes. <laughs> and it needs to be integrated. And the mistake I made for too long, Ryan, was I had my head cut off from my body. <laughs> all right? And I thought that the only thing that mattered was the head. And it's not true. You know, when I, <laughs> in fact, it, it struck me. You know, uh, you know, when you lead a large organization, you have big meetings, suddenly before COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, after I would make a speech about, you know, where we are as a company, where we're going and so forth, do you think that people in the audience truly remembered everything I said and were so impressed by how smart I was? No, 
it was all about how I made them feel. Mm. And, um, you know, again, a company is a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. And it's a, it's a human adventure. What a, when you're hiring for a leadership role, you bear, what are some of the must have qualities? And maybe even what are some of the, I love to go inside your interview process when yeah. you're, yeah. When, when, when somebody's meeting with you to get a big job, a big leadership job, that's, yeah. that's, that's obviously important. What are maybe some questions you ask and some absolute must have qualities in that person? And so there also have evolved, uh, Ryan. I used to place a lot of emphasis on expertise and experience. So I would want, you know, the best e-commerce person or the, the best supply chain person or the best, whatever, marketing person. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, you know, see whether the person was a good person, but uh, really place a lot of emphasis on expertise and experience. Over the years, when people got to my, you know, my, my office, usually we had assessed their expertise and experience and you, know, you use search firms that they, they help you with that. My main focus was understanding the person. Who is this person? What drives them? Is it about themselves? Uh, is it about um, their success? How do they want to be remembered? What kind of a leader do they want to be? So when I was, <laughs> when I was interviewed for the CEO job at Calcium Companies, uh, another Minneapolis-based company, uh, I was interviewed on a long, so this was on our plane coming back from Paris, going back to Minneapolis. So this was an eight hour interview. <laughs> so she was the daughter of the founder and I was, you know, a candidate to replace her as the CEO of the company. One of the questions she asked me is, Hubert, tell me about your soul. Tell me about, who asked this question? What did you say? Yet, <laughs> well, I told her about my soul and, and, you know, what my inner life was and what mattered to me and, you know, the meaning of my life and, and things of that nature. Deep, man. That's, and yeah. I thought... Now, I don't, I don't use these words because Marilyn is, you know, special, fabulous of the child. But I ask, I use questions such as, what drives you? How do you want to be remembered? You know, what would you like people to say at your, you know, in your eulogy? Mm. Uh, and uh, I place a lot of emphasis on this because the, the, Ryan, the most, I believe the most important decision we get to make as leaders is who do we put in positions of leadership? Mm -hmm. So if you share this vision of purposeful leadership and a purposeful human organization, having a purposeful leader is critical. So back to your question about criteria. So at some point in our journey uh, at Best Buy, the team, my executive team encouraged me to uh, be more explicit about our leadership expectations. We had been implicit, but they wanted me to be explicit. And so I developed the five Bs of purposeful leadership. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the last chapter in the book. <laughs> so I'm gonna share it with you. Uh, the first B is about being purposeful. So being clear about your own purpose, which is what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Being clear and curious about the purpose of people around you. And, and if we have time, I'll tell you a couple of stories there. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do a good job of connecting these individual purposes with the purpose of the company, making the link, which is where magic happens. Second, be clear about your role as a leader. We talked about it. It's not about being the smartest person in the room and making sure everybody knows how smart you are, but it's about creating this environment where others can be successful. It's about being clear about who you serve. So I told the officers at Best Buy, you know, if you're here to serve yourself or your boss or me as the CEO of the company, it's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Except you cannot work here. <laughs> you, can be, you can be promoted to being a Best Buy customer, which is a fabulous thing. We'll take care of you. It's going to be great, but you cannot work here. 
On the other hand, if you're here to serve people on the front line, then we're good. The fourth B is, you know, be values driven. Of course, integrity is foundational. And the fifth B is be authentic. Be yourself, be human, be vulnerable, be the best version of yourself, because that's how you're going to connect with others, right? If you're, if you're perfect, you cannot love somebody who's perfect. You can admire them, but you cannot connect with them. If in order to, and Bernie Brown, of course, talks about this beautifully, uh, in order to connect to somebody else, you, 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 they need to be vulnerable. And, and, and in fact, to love somebody else, it's well known that you first need to love yourself. If you don't love yourself, you cannot love others. And loving yourself starts with accepting your imperfections and your vulnerabilities and making peace. I'm not perfect. I'm doing my best, but I'm not perfect. And I blew this and I blew that. And so that's a very, so these are the five Bs. And we were very explicit. Uh, about this in our selection of leaders, in our promotion of leaders, uh, in our development of leaders, um, it matters. You also, I think, did a, um, were known for someone who used layoffs or reducing headcount as an absolute last resort. And I feel like there are places I've, 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 I've been where it didn't feel like it was the last resort. It felt like it was a yearly tradition yeah. uh, because you got to hit profit for the quarter or the year yeah. or whatever it may be. And I realize CEOs have really tough jobs that I haven't had yet, but um, it feels like there's got to be a better way than just having the yearly tradition of where are we going to cut in order to yeah. hit the number. There has to be a better way. And your, this is one of your, this is something that you are known for. Yeah. The, the, my turnaround manual <laughs> has several chapters. One of the chapter is uh, four levers you pull. And the last one, last resort is headcount reduction. The first one is grow the business. <laughs> Find out how to grow the business. Growth can, you know, will do marvelous things. As relates to cost, um, and I do believe that companies on an ongoing basis need to improve efficiencies, right? Mm -hmm. That's what human beings do. We, we, we try to be better and better at, at things. And at Best Buy every year, we would take out two or $300 million of cost to be able to fund our investments, right? You, you, that's something that's healthy to do. But you focus first on uh, what I call non-salary expenses, which is everything in the cost structure that is not that has nothing to do with people, and um, if that is usually at most companies the majority of the cost structure. So let me take an example. Uh, so at Best Buy, do we sell a lot of TVs, Ryan? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. They're large, they're thin, so they break. We used to break about two hundred million dollars worth of TVs every year. Wow, uh, that's a lot. But yeah. you know, presumably we maybe we sell I don't know ten billion dollars worth of TVs or something like this. If you can reduce what we call the TV junk out by fifty percent, you save hundred million dollars. Good for the customers, right? Because we've done a survey, zero percent exactly of customers want to buy a broken TV. <laughs> That's how you know. It's and it's good for our vendors. It's good for us. And so that's what you do and continuously look for ways to eliminate. We call it waste and efficiencies. So uh, reduce waste and uh, reduce inefficiencies in all of the processes. Now, the third lever is optimize benefits. So uh, an example of this is healthcare costs. So of course, in the US, most companies are self-insured. Uh, so if your workforce is healthy, Guess what? Your healthcare costs go down. Ta-da! Good for the cost, good for the employees, good for the PL. Uh, if one plus two plus three, so revenue growth, non-salary expenses, benefits is not sufficient to drive the necessary, remember financial performance is imperative, the necessary you know, financial performance, uh, uh, sometimes you have to go after headcount. But you do it as a last resource. So you don't see employees as the problem. You usually see them as the solution. And yet, even when you reduce headcount, you try to redeploy people. So let me take an example. At some point in our journey, 
we decided to close the Best Buy mobile standalone stores. These are Mobay's smallish 1,000 square foot stores that were just focused on selling uh, smartphones, essentially. At some point when we opened them around 2006, the, the launch of the, of the iPhone, it, they made complete sense. Uh, 12 years later, not so much. So for good business reasons, we decide to close them down. It's about two or 300 stores, 1,000 people out of 125,000 people at the time. We tell the employees uh, why, what we're gonna do and why, and then we tell them, we love you. We think the world of you, you have great, these great skills that together we spend years, you, know, you spend years developing, and we've, we've got this great company called Best Buy. Probably there's a big box, you know, Best Buy store, not far from your Best Buy mobile standalone store. And we're gonna work, we're gonna do our best to see what uh, opportunities exist at the, at the company. And we're gonna take the time, we're gonna take three months, I think it was, to do that. Now, if for whatever reason, you decide that, uh, you know, you wanna move on, or, you know, there's actually not a, a good opportunity for it that's okay you know you, you can decide to leave and we'll give you severance and whatnot but we'd like to keep you and you know at most companies it's the opposite we're eliminating your job here's the check because there's a legal obligation to offer severance but you know the legal profession should not drive how we deal with people you, know, you tell them if you want you can have severance but we, frankly, we would love for you to stay because we love you, you know? And so um, that's the philosophy. And yes, when I joined Best Buy, a lot of people were telling me, cut, 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 you're gonna have to close doors, reduce headcount massively. Um, and I looked, pretty much all of the stores were profitable. That was not the problem, you know? <laughs> the problem is that our prices were not competitive, our website was terrible, our supply chain was awful. And our store experience was not great, um, so all things we could uh, we could fix. So these are fundamental points about how to lead. Uh, you know, there's a chapter in the book that's uh, how to turn around a business without everybody hating you. Because the principles we're talking about about purposeful human leadership, it's not just for the good times. It equally applies when things are tough. In fact, even more so because you need the heart and soul and the, the energy of everybody at the company to save the company as opposed to treating them like, you know, the problem mm -hmm. and of hitting, the way we're gonna hit earnings is we're gonna, you know, cut Jack and Mary, you know, that's crazy. The One of the other aspects that was going on as you get the role is Amazon's becoming just a behemoth. They're taking over the world. Um, uh, I've bought a TV on Amazon and I've also bought one at Best Buy. Um, and our, and it seems pretty easy to buy one on Amazon. You get reviews. You can even go look at them at Best Buy and then buy it on Amazon. Maybe it's cheaper. So you're facing this challenge that I think some would say is just, this is inevitable. What, what to do? This is and, the end. And yet when you look at, look at the kind of the pub per your book, one of the top blurbs is from Jeff Bezos himself. Um, what did you decide to do and how did you work with Jeff Bezos and Amazon in order to thrive when I think a lot of people thought it was going to put, you, they were going to put you out of business? The, the first thing we did, because you, you, the phenomenon you described, Ryan, was called showrooming, yes. right? People coming to our store, talking to our store. I think I've personally done this. A lot of people of probably have. Yeah. Of course. And then yeah. buy online, in particular at the time, remember there was no sales tax when you bought online. It was a bit of an unfair advantage that uh, Amazon had. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then prices you know, were perceived to be lower. So uh, if somebody asks you who killed showrooming in America, you say, well, I met him, it's Hubert. <laughs> <laughs> How did we kill showrooming? Well, we decided that our prices were going to be the same. And number two, that uh, blue shirts would have the power, the authority to match online prices. No question asked, right? Because Ryan, you've spent 30 minutes with uh, Mary to talk about this beautiful Sony TV or Samsung, whatever. And then you, you leave empty handed. Mary can say, no, no, no. <laughs> if you think about buying, 
I'll, I'll match the price and then you'll have it. Everybody will deliver it for you. So we took price of the table, number one. Number two, Amazon, you know, is Amazon good online? Yes, they are. Was Best Buy good online? No, we were terrible. The, the blue shirts of the week one told me better. The search engine on the bestbuy.com site is not working. I said, what, what do you mean it's not working? Well, type Cinderella in the search bar, you'll get Nikon cameras. It rhymes, but it's not quite the same. So we fixed the website. We also invested in the supply chain. So now we deliver as fast as Amazon. So in many ways, we actually neutralize Amazon's same price, buy online, great supply chain. You can uh, either ship or pick up in store. So very convenient. And then we invested in our own strength. So I was not obsessed by Amazon. So I want to be obsessed by the customers. Mm -hmm. And so we created a whole series of things great for the customers you know we improve the customer experience we created these partnerships with the the, the vendors I'll come to amazon in a second but uh, you know apple samsung uh, lg sony canon nikon at and verizon you know and so on and so forth and we gave them the opportunity to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars uh, of r d and showcase that in our stores. That's that's something they needed. So it was good for the customers, right? Because you could look at Apple, which is Samsung, and then integrate, right? It, there's no home, there's no home in America with a single brand. Tim Cook's home has non-Apple products in it, right? Because Apple doesn't do TVs or refrigerators, right? I've checked. <laughs> uh, and so you need somebody to integrate the, the whole thing. So we work with that. As it relates to Amazon. So there's a disease in the world, which is the idea of zero sum game. Ryan, if you're gonna win, that means I lose. I think that's a terrible disease. You know, if you take Amazon and Best Buy together in the US uh, uh, collective market share of the consumer electronics market is about 25%. And so what I would used to tell our investors is, yes, Amazon is growing. Oh, we're growing too. And there's this other 75% that we can go after Oh, and by the way, we can grow the market as well. So it's not a zero sum game. Second, Amazon, of course, you know, has multiple facets. They have uh, Amazon Web Services, their retailer, and their product company. You know, remember they have the Kindle, all of the Echo, Alexa products, and so forth. So we made the decision early on. It started before my time, and I decided to continue to sell Amazon products in our stores. Other retailers were not so enamored with the idea because they saw Amazon as the enemy. We said, no, it's, these are great products. Customers want it. Why do we exist? It's to help customers. So we always sold their, their products. In fact, to the point that uh, if you go to an, into a Best Buy store today, there's an Amazon store within a store. There's a table with all of the Alexa products next to the Google table where you can test and see how all of the Alexa products work together. Right? So we're showcasing, so we killed, we killed showrooming and we invest, invented showcasing. Mm. We're showcasing Amazon's product. And then what happened, which was a jaw dropper, <laughs> uh, Amazon decided to give us the exclusive rights to the Fire TV platform, you know, their smart TV uh, platform, which is fabulous to be integ integrated in smart TVs. And these Fire TV powered TVs would only be sold at Best Buy or by Best Buy on Amazon. Pretty amazing deal. When we announced it, uh, uh, we did a little event in a store uh, not far from uh, Amazon's headquarters in Bellevue, Washington, and Jeff came uh, and we had a good conversation. I knew him you know, from business circles and from being a vendor, of course. And so we had media, we had the Wall Street Journal, we had the Star Tribune, Variety, and, and so forth. And one of the things uh, that Jeff said is, look, uh, a TV is a considerate purchase. You know, you need to see it. And Best Buy is the best place in the world where uh, to see it. And, uh, and of course, then he was complimentary about our turnaround. And the, the reporter from the Star Tribune, which is the Minneapolis newspaper, I mean, their jaw literally dropped. And you used the word trust. Mm -hmm. 
Right? One of the things that Jeff told me is that because we had been working together for 10 years, we had the two teams, not he and I simply, but the two teams had developed a trust-based relationship. We knew we could work together and that we could trust each other. Uh, and so that led to the, to the deal. And so I love this idea of seeing possibilities and of going for win-win-win deals, good for the customers, good for the vendors, and, and good for us. Big lesson for me of the last, uh, you know, of my time at Best Buy. Love it, Hubert. Uh, one more question. So there is um, probably somebody earlier in their career who is listening who really uh, wants to live a purposeful, purposeful life, help others serve, be an excellent leader, um, leave their mark in a positive way so that it impacts others. What are some general pieces of life slash career advice you would give to that person? Um, so I would, I would highlight maybe a couple. One is we've already talked about, it, which is uh, spend time. It's going to take time. You know, if you're when I teach the MBA students at Harvard, they they don't have the answer usually, but spend time during the life trying to figure out why you're here and your purpose in life, right? And you can get help through meditation, you know, spirituality, a coach, a personal board of directors, your spouse, uh, but spending time with yourself is really good on that. My friend, Bill George, he's got a, a, a men's group that he's been, they meet every week on Wednesdays at 7 a.m. and they've been doing this for 35 years. Wow. So they support each other. So that's a, so really work on that. The second thing is the advice from, we, we mentioned him at the beginning, right? Of my good friend, Jim Citrin at Spencer Stewart. And he wrote years ago in Yahoo Finance, a column where he wrote, the best leaders don't climb to the top. They are carried to the top. The best leaders don't climb to the top. They are carried to the top. So there's a big element of philosophy, which is where you are today, because the only moment where we are always living, right, is today. Uh, try to be the best version of yourself and help others do a great job and assume good things will happen. Now, I think his advice is primarily good, notably good for us boys. Uh, I think the advice for women needs to be slightly different. There's a great book by Sally Helgerson called how women rise mm -hmm. that uh, she actually wrote with uh, Marshall Goldsmith. I may have it here. I do actually, I'll do a little infomercial for her. <laughs> so how women rise, it's advice for women in their career. And one of the things that uh, she has noticed and that I've noticed too, is that when a boy is, I say a boy, right? A man is 80% ready for a promotion will tend to say, oh, we're ready. Mm -hmm. When a woman is 125% ready for a promotion, generally speaking, not always true, but off, more often than not, we'll say, I'm not sure I'm ready. Plus, I may not have finished what I was doing here. And so that means as leaders, and I gave Sally's book to all of our people leader at Best Buy, notice the difference. And when there's a promotion opportunity, don't be fooled by what people, the, the, the man and the woman are saying. Mm -hmm. Develop your own perspective, potentially put your thumb on the scale so that, you know, the woman who's 125% ready actually has a better chance to have the promotion compared to the man who is 80% ready, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the other way around. Yeah. So these would be some thoughts. I, I love it. Well, you bear, I could uh, listen to your stories all day, man. I really appreciate it. The book is called The Heart of Business Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. It looks great. Love the title, man. I know. Uh, and I love the uh, the cover you have of all the people because that's that's what you're really all about, shaped in a heart. Um, and I encourage people to, to check it out because it's really well done. And I just appreciate your your investment of time and the way that you came to this and showed up. Uh, I'll, I'll say it here publicly, just that you came with such excitement and generosity towards me 
um, and care and, and preparation, man, that means a lot to me. So I, I just want to say thank you very much and, and acknowledge that. Well, thank you, Ryan. And uh, for everybody who is on this journey, good luck. I hope that uh, this book is a gift, you know, and that you can use it to, uh, as I've learned from others, right, along the way, to try to get better. That's our journey, right, to get better. That's it. That's it. Well, Uber, thanks so much again. And I'd love to continue our dialogue uh, yeah. as we both progress, man. Look forward to that. Thank you, awesome. Ryan. Thank you.